Good morning. I hope wherever you are this morning, whether you're sitting in your living room or your kitchen or having breakfast, I'm praying that you are safe and that you are blessed and that you will be even more blessed today after listening to the Word of God. I'm John Withers, pastor here at New Hope Community Church in South San Francisco, California. I welcome your presence here with me this morning. And I just want to, for the sake of time, I just want to bless the Word right now. Father, we ask that you'll bless this Word, bless the listeners to your Word, these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever thought perhaps or figured out that sometimes you have gotten the short end of the stick? I know I have felt that way a time or two and I've said to myself, Lord, can a brother just have a break? I have felt that way on many occasions, but I'm sure that in the process of that, we must look and understand that when God is getting ready to do something in our lives, we must be extremely flexible to allow him the opportunity to do whatever needs to be done in order to benefit us later on down the road. We can't always see what God is doing in the present, but we can certainly look at what he has done for us in the past, knowing that the present situation will be even better in the future. With this coronavirus, there are a lot of uncertainties. But we too will get through this with time, with faith, with hope, and trusting in the living God that we are serving. You see, we don't always get the opportunity to choose what happens to us. But what matters are the things, what we do about those things that has happened to us. I want to tell you a story this morning, perhaps you are well too familiar in the Bible. In the Old Testament, in the book of Genesis, chapter 37, for the sake of time, I won't even read it. I'll just tell you the story, and then during your time, you can go back and read it. Chapter 37, it talks about a young man by the name of Joseph. Joseph got a real raw deal. But here's what it was. Joseph was about 17 years of age, and he got these prophetic dreams that came strictly from the Lord. And in those dreams, uh, he's the 11th child out of 12, and um, the youngest, and he has these dreams that he's going to reign and rule over his other brothers who are a lot older than him. Of course, they didn't like the idea of what Joseph was saying, and, but it came up with the fact that they hated him. They hated Joseph for a lot of reasons. One, Joseph had favor with God. Two, Joseph had favor with his father. His father loved him. And three, Joseph had prophetic gifts from the Lord. Now, all of that makes sense. I probably would have hated him too. But, you know, <laughs> as a young man and you seeing this man just gifted above all the circumstances that you could ever endure. But yet, we don't understand that we oftentimes we see the glory in an individual, but we don't know their story. So today I want to tell you the story of Joseph who went through a horrific ordeal. Let's look at it for example. Joseph's 17 years old. He has these prophetic dreams. He has brothers. One of the biggest mistakes perhaps that he made is that he was proud. You know, as any 17 year old, he was arrogant. He thought he had it all together. He told them his dreams that one day I'm going to rule over you. I don't know about you again. I don't think any brother want to hear that from another brother or a sister, regardless of their age. But the case being, he tells them that. So they plant a scheme. That scheme was to murder Joseph. Not to hurt him, but to murder him. Their father's name is Jacob. And again, he favored Joseph. And here's Joseph is going down with his brothers, and they decide to put him in a cistern, which is a well. But for the last moment of decision, they decide to sell him to a car caravan that's going to Egypt. And as they sell him, they come back and they tell their father, Father, your son, your dearest son, has been mauled by a lion or a bear doesn't really tell exactly what he was mauled by, but we know that they tell this lie 
to their father. Now the father is heartbroken that his favorite son has been chewed up and torn to pieces by this wild animal. And his brothers sat there and let the father moan and mourn for days in about their, his youngest, their youngest brother. As a result, Joseph goes down to Egypt. He's sold into slavery. And here's what happens. You see, even though we hear this saying on many occasions that the devil is in the details, God is in the bigger details. So don't ever forget that. That's why the scripture says, the Lord's arm is not shortened that I cannot save you. Neither is your ear heavy that I cannot hear you. I know exactly where you are. I'm not going to forsake you. I'm not going to leave you. But lo, I will be with you always, even until the end of the earth. I repeat those scriptures because they are so encouraging to me whenever a situation is occurred in my life. So here we have Joseph is sold into slavery. And now he all of a sudden wins favor with the chief captain of Pharaoh's army, who is Potiphar. Oliver makes Joseph in charge of everything in his household. Amazing. But again, the devil's on his side watching him. You know what he's watching? He's watching his character. He's watching his integrity. He was watching his every move. Now, the Bible says that Joseph is a handsome man. Needless to say, Potiphar's wife is after Joseph. So every day that Joseph comes into the house, she's trying to seduce him in any kind of way that she possibly can. One day, Joseph goes into the house and nobody's there but Potiphar's wife. And she says to him, point blank, come to bed with me. Now, I would call her something else, but I'm a Christian. I'm not gonna do that here today. However, she just point blankly said, come to bed with me. Joseph has a coat on and he takes off running and he's running. She grabs his coat and she holds the coat in her hand. She makes all these false accusations against Joseph. And as a result, she makes those false accusations. Potiphar ends up not only firing Joseph, but he puts him into prison for 10, 12 years. It's a long time. And so now here's Joseph in prison and he's wondering, am I gonna ever get out? You see what I'm saying here? Here's the guy who has gotten the short end of the stick. He even prophesied, he believed God. But folks, this should also tell us, our timing is not God's timing. Our ways are not God's ways. And I always look at it this way right here. Perhaps in the midst of this situation that is going on, Joseph is getting some training that he so desperately needs. And he's also maturing and growing up to fit the crown that God has already prepared for him on down the road because he's going to bring him to a place of stature. Now, here's the deal. Joseph's in prison. Now, there is a cup bearer. That is the guy who serves the king. And there is a cake, cheap cake baker, a baker. So these two guys, they end up in prison because they made Potiphar very angry and some of Pharaoh's chief executives very angry. They put them in prison. Remember, Joseph is there. He's in prison. Joseph is not only a dreamer. But Joseph is an interpreter of dreams. Now, this guy has skills. He's gifted. And these two guys, they wake up one morning and 
lo and behold, they have dreams. And these dreams are bothering them. And as a result of these dreams, the cupbearer comes over and says, hey, listen, I had this dream. And he tells Joseph, and Joseph interprets the dreams and he said, only God can interpret dreams. He tells him that. So he interprets the dream and says, hey, look, in three days, you're going to be out of here and Pharaoh is going to lift you up. You'll be back in your old position. Damn. The baker, the chief baker, felt so good about the dream that he gave the cupbearer. He asked him, hey, I had a dream too. I'm wondering, can you interpret Joseph tells him, yes. Three days later from now, you will be hanged. Not what the cake, chief cake bearer wanted to hear, but that's exactly what happened. But he tells the chief cup bearer is that when you go up to see Pharaoh, please remember me and tell him what I have done for you. Of course, they forgot. See, this is why I say sometimes this is just a bad deal altogether. But while God may not prevent all our hardship, he can redeem anything, even the worst of hardships. So, a few days, a few years later, now you got Pharaoh. He's having a dream. And Pharaoh needs someone to interpret his dream. Not only he needs for them to interpret, but he needs for them to to give what, the, what it was in the dream in details. And then all of a sudden, the cupbearer remembered Joseph. Hey, I know a guy who interprets dreams and his name is Joseph and he's in prison. As a result, Joseph gets out. He interprets the dream for Pharaoh. He wins favor for Pharaoh. He tells Pharaoh that seven years of famine is going to come. So we need to, and that's going to be seven years of plenty, which means that the first seven years is going to be seven years of plenty, and then the next seven years is going to be seven years of famine. So he already prepares all the food, sells it to anyone who comes around, he sells the food, but they store up enough food for seven years. It's been a long time since he's seen his brothers. Lo and behold, they are coming because they have no food, and they need to buy grain. Joseph recognizes them, but they never recognized him. And he lets them come in one by one. And then he begins to see the little one, Reuben. And he begins to cry because he knew that he was the one who actually saved his life when he told his brothers not to murder him. You see, when we stop and we think about some of these things right here, Joseph comes to see God's hands in tragedies of his life. But when you look at the tragedies of his life, we all go through these things. It depends on whether we want to become a victim because of what has happened in our life, or we stand still and know that God is God. He said, I will not forsake you or leave you in eternity. I will not push you by the wayside. I see. see. You see, we don't understand all the details, but we do know one thing. We serve a resurrected Christ. Who would ever believe that a God that loves us or will love his children will allow him to be sold into slavery, falsely accused of rape, in prison for years that he did not do anything, something he did not do, all for God to create a position of influence with the world leader in order to save the lives of God's own people. God would test you in many ways. But the biggest test is the test of time. You see, we need to understand timing is a big deal in the eyes of God. The scripture says that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years. And a thousand years is as one day. I couldn't understand some things. The beauty of a thankful spirit is that it has the power to replace anger with love, resentment with happiness, fear with faith, and worry with peace. I leave this here with you this morning. You don't have anything to worry about. You need to trust in the living God. 
Trust in him, whatever your circumstances, whatever your situations. If you're going through trials and battles and struggles in life and you are a believer, put your trust in the one who is above all of us. We all need a savior. Scripture says we are all sinners. And so therefore, I ask you this morning, no matter what your trial, the scripture says in Romans 8, 18, for I reckon that the sufferings of this old present time, it is not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. I want you to know, and I want to encourage you this morning, God won't let you down. I know it's tough out here. I know it's difficult. It's difficult for me to stay at home. The only place I come is to the church here sometimes, alone to check the mail, do my sermons, and then I leave. I don't, I'm not in contact with anyone else besides my family. I want you to rest assured, God wants us to have a peace of mind. Cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you and me. If you really want to get to know Jesus, you simply have to ask him into your heart. How do I do that, Pastor? Simply confess that you, like me, we are sinners and we need a Savior. And his name is Jesus. And that from this day on, you will live for him. It's that simple. It's that simple. I ask him to come into your heart and Lord to change me because I can't do it on my own. Nobody can do that without the love of God. He said, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's why I love that scripture, that our ways are not his ways, neither are our thoughts his thoughts. Trust in the Lord. Did Joseph get a raw deal? You bet he did. But he was able to see the hand of God truly undertaken in his life. Yeah, he went through all these changes, but you know what? He needed that in the end because he became the governor of Pharaoh. I remember a story of a young girl, a little child, she couldn't have been no more than about seven or eight years of age. She goes into the grocery store with her mom and the cashier saw her and he said, hey honey, you want some candy? This was back in the day. And she just smiled at him, she didn't say anything. And he reached the jar of candy to her and said, I'll take some. And she still didn't take it. So he reached in the jar with his hands and poured out a big handful of candy and put it in a bag for her. When the mother and the child got to the car, the mother asked the little girl, honey, why didn't you put your hand into the jar and take some candy? And she looked up at her mother with a great big smile. She said, because his hands was bigger. And that's the way the Lord is with us. His hands are bigger than ours. He's in a position to take care of us. He has a love that is unbelievable. I oftentimes look at the love of a mother with her child. No matter how old that child is, how young that child is, there is no greater love than to see a mother's love to a child. That's the closest thing I can see in comparison to the love of God for us. That child, no matter how young, no matter how old, you see these great big football players, basketball guys, football, soccer, when anything exciting happens to them, hello, mom, mom. That's a great love. That is a wonderful love. I believe God gives us that same type of love. I want you to do me a favor this morning. I want you to go on to uh, our YouTube. If you're already on, subscribe to our YouTube. Tell others about it. It's one of the greatest favors that you can do for me this morning. I want everybody to hear the good news of Jesus because we need each other in the situations that we are in right now. We don't know what this is going to turn out to be, but we need to be praying and helping those who need our help. And I just pray that God will continue to bless our doctors, our nurses, our uh, frontline uh, people who go out and help, uh, first responders, our teachers uh, that are at home, uh, firefighters, police officers, even our politicians, our government, our president. I pray
pray for all of them. I pray for families that are shut in, our, our people that are elderly, that, that are in a devastating point. I pray for the poor. I pray that you too, we all can do something. There's uh, something I read some time ago is that we are put on here to, on earth not to be just good people, but to do something good as well. I hope that you are blessed this morning and that you have a wonderful Sunday. God bless you. We'll see you soon. And next Sunday, be prepared. I have something for you. Blessings. Amen.